concerns about how to TA and how to start the class the first day, uh, but actually it's not that bad. So we're here today to answer all your questions and give you information from the inside view. So, um, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have today. machines are in that room. They're a little different for each machine and I'll go over a little of that. Uh, we will offer trainings before the term and you can ask for an appointment throughout the semester if you want by contacting Shada for a healing and using your cells. So this simple scan drum machine uses these forms. Uh, it just picks up which ones are wrong and you can choose to correct answer that. It's the fastest option and the instructions are right over the machine in a giant poster. For the red forms, uh, we have two forms that I'll go over in a second. And this machine is hooked up to a computer so that it can track all the data from all the tests. It requires a username that is associated with your primary instructor and they can give that to you if they want you to run any scantrons on it. So first, for the first assignment, if your instructor wants to use the red machine, they need to use the big one so that it can automatically enroll all the students into the course. And on the back is where they would fill out the test. For any other, any other quiz, test, exam, uh, they can use the skinny one. And when the student inputs their ID, it will automatically associate it with their enrolled number. If you have questions about the Scantron machines, you can also contact Shada Curriculum, and our phone number is listed in the room. Any questions about Scantron machines? <laughs> you did so well, nobody has questions. I was going to say, and they will. This, this was one of the um, topics that people most asked for. How to work those darn Scantron machines, and darn was not the word they used. Okay. <laughs> Are you going to say it? We're all. We're being recorded. Um, was, it, was 
my presentation yeah. recorded? Oh, it works. That's <laughs> bones and all. Like that. that works for me. Uh, my name is Angela Dixon. I work in Shaw with Jesse um, as the course scheduling coordinator. And I just want to reiterate one thing that Jesse said, which is that we send out an email to you all instructors before the beginning of the term. Um, and we give you guys several opportunities to sign up for ScanCon trainings. And they're 15, 20 minutes tops. They really don't last very long. Um, and then once you've had the training, even, at, even after that, if you need one-on-one -on -one assistance, you can shoot us an email, let us know, and we can come over and set up a time when we can help you um, to run your forms for your first assignment, because the, um, the red form machine in particular can be a little daunting, but it's really not that bad. Um, well, I've heard different, I've heard different, different perspectives, so. First time I used it, nobody told me I had to save the data before I tried it, and, and so I kept, I had to rerun the same set six times. And none of us can figure out. So it, well, it, they can't it can be bad. It can be a beast. But we're here to help. So as much as we can, we like to give that to you guys. So. Yeah, I didn't lose this. That's okay. Social use a lot of scantrons. Anthro won't use any. It's just the nature of the. Oh, we'll see. There you go.
questions about like grading. So like I like you said, like Andrew, they write a lot of essays. You have to grade those. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'm here to address your commenting and grading in the next session, if that's at all no. useful to know. Um, but I, are we moving to the panel of experienced TA Q and A at this point, or is that just thinking it's Scantron's copiers, and then am I wrong? No, I think that's how. Okay. I think it's not very definitive, but yeah. Okay. It's cool. So, any more Scantron questions? Copiers. Everybody's got their copy cup. So, uh, how do you guys actually copy? Because it seems like there's a lot of rules about copying your code. What do you do? Uh, when you're ready to copy, you just put it in like you normally would, and then there will be a login screen, kind of, mm -hmm. and you just type in the code and I'm, log I'm in sorry, and I don't mean like procedure. Like, how do you make copies? If you have to go and, and make a copy of something, where do you go? What, which which method do you use? Is what I'm trying to ask. Sorry. You go down in three copy machines, you enter your code, and then you just do like any other Xerox. The only tricky part sometimes is that you have to actually get the, like when you're the TA that you're, or excuse me, the instructor that you're working for with, that person has to actually provide you with their code because we don't assign codes to individual TAs, they're assigned per course based on the enrollment of the class. So the code goes to the instructor and then the, the instructor distributes it to the TAs accordingly. Okay, I don't know if this has happened here or if I overheard it, but is there a thing that is running out of copies? Like, the yep. instructors only assign so many? Yep. Okay. It happens, and the instructors can request them through um, through our office if they need increased copies, and they review the request, and generally they're approved based, I mean, it depends on, I don't really, that's not really our department, but I know that they can be requested. Um, we recommend kind of keeping track of the copies as you go so that it's not the day before a final and all of a sudden you're out of copies. Um, that has happened before and I'm not, I don't quite know our turnaround time because again that's not, we don't do that financial part of the office, but um, they, it increased allotments can be requested. I've, I've noticed a lot of TAs would come, and most of them would say that we would work off of like, they would, um, like if they had discussion questions or whatnot, and they would either just be listed on the props or some of them I really appreciated is when they actually showed up with copy of questions in hand. You can kind of like make notes as a student, make notes, you know, as we're giving the discussions. So I was just curious, because I would probably take advantage of that. I like to hand people something they could physically the be So just to clarify, the requests have to come from the supervising instructor, and because it's a green campus, they tend to encourage not having copies. So I'm not saying it depends, it's, again, it's very much instructor by instructor and the current grad students may have more insight into how that works, but my understanding is they definitely try to err on the side of not printing copies. And yeah, don't go printing, if you have the code, don't go printing something that your instructor doesn't know you're printing mm -hmm. because he or she may be keeping track of how many copies they have. And they get real pissed when they show up and they can't get it. Um, okay. One thing you can do is all of our printers will also scan the PDF. So if there is something you need to share with your uh, discussion session section, is you can take that same code, go in and scan it to PDF, and it will email it to you, and then you can post it up on props. And that way, then the students are responsible. It's their ink, their paper, whatever. So use that function if you need to distribute stuff to your students that isn't within the count that your instructor, because your instructor has requested X, right? She knows, he or she knows how many finals they're gonna have, how many midterms they're gonna have, how many handouts, that's it. And that's what they're authorized for. You use more than that, you're, you're gonna get yourself there. Right, so I've, I agree with Michael. Like, I needed, sometimes I needed to hand out like uh, assignments to my students that I created for that day or whatever. Um, if I wanted to give it to them, like I have access to my lab and like resources from our department, mm -hmm. so I was able to use our printer to print it out. Of course, you need to you should consult with like the chair of your department or your advisor or whoever is in charge of the lab and see if you're allowed to do that. Um, for us, it was reasonable. My discussions were really small, and I and I usually split them up in groups, so they got one page per group. Oh, so then okay. I only had to print like six things, which I was fine doing. Um, and then, like, the printers in the library are pretty reasonable. It's like four cents a page. So you can just go print something there if it's not that bad. Or you can just, like, 
give it to them and ask them specifically right before discussion, or give them a couple days, I don't know. Um, and you just let them know, like, we're going to do this in class, make sure to bring a copy. Like, a copy. <coughs> My experience with copying, so I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm a, I've been a teaching assistant in um, psychology, and they really don't print anything except exams. Um, you don't have discussion sections, so you don't have handouts. Everything's on props that can possibly be on props. Um, so the way it usually works is the instructor record will email um, a PDF of the exam, you know, a day or two before, and say, please prove this, make sure there are no errors. Um, and then I'm responsible for printing out a single copy of that, and then I go make 300 copies of it, whatever. Um, and I've never run out of paper before. I haven't run into that problem. Always allow adequate time for that too, because it yeah. takes way to make. I think oh, I forget what it is. Like 300 copies of a 10-page test takes like a solid half an hour or something like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Assuming there's paper in the machine, it yeah, doesn't jam. jam. <laughs> yeah. There are staples. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, about the copy machine, first of all, uh, you have to get an email from your instructor that you tell you how many is the limit, and they tell you the code in there, so you know how many. About, uh, one tricky thing is the stapling. So no one <laughs> tells you that, but then the first time you want to print out like, and copy a, a huge number of paper, then don't staple it by hand because the machine does it automatically. I did not know that <laughs> the first time. It was like, yeah, there were many of them. And I had to staple them by hand, and, and then someone told me that it's just a pro uh, process you can you can choose that as like ending process. It t gives you an option, and then you just put staple, and then it gives you an option which side you want to staple it, or those kinds of options. Just remember, like push that button and save yourself a lot of people. Remember that. Don't tell you that. <laughs> the other thing I find tricky is double sided. I always use the wrong logic. Like I think, okay, I have two pieces of paper. I want to make it into one. And it, I always push the wrong one and end up wasting like five copies. So, I always, so now I always try one, mm -hmm. and if I get it right, then I'm like, okay, now I can make all of the 300 or what. I've never had to have 300, but you know, try it. If you're making a double-sided thing, make it once and see if you do it right or get somebody's help because <laughs> I always do it wrong. Right, and then there's also the trick if the professor is using two kinds of, like two different formats, like version one and two. I think that's like a great idea to keep in mind, like test it, you know, like try one first and yeah. see how it turns out. Because after many times, like I always tested it anyway, because I was like, oh, I don't mess it up. I only like I have half an hour. Am I gonna cut it? I don't know. But like so, give yourself time, test it. I don't know. Make sure that you have the right version. Sometimes they're cruel and they ask you to do it yourself, like sort them, do version one and then two. chance to ask all of those questions about being a TA to specific people in your program or in your department? Um, what have you always wanted to know? And those are the people to ask. <laughs> Do we have access to other like refresh services or business services like uh, large format? Like, we need to make other materials that the professor asks for. Is there a, like, a, uh, a That's his or her services? job to arrange for that. You okay. might be sent to go use the, the plotter in the Shaw office or something yes. like that, but they'll make those arrangements. You okay. don't have to worry about it. Right. So then our instructor will be responsible for. Will we go to them for like markers and stuff like that? And the point markers or dry what are those? Dry I've never had an instructor give me dry erase markers. Go buy one. Yeah, yeah. Like just buy them. And I love doing it like there. it's yes. gold. <laughs> because if it gets left in a room, it's gone. Same with adapters. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you guys definitely. Oh. That's something I have to learn the hard way. Like, you guys, if you're going to do like a PowerPoint or 
set something up on your laptop, like you need to bring your own, like if you have a Mac, the they're not set up for that. Yeah, you need your own little adapter. <laughs> if it's an emergency, IT will give you one, but they're really annoyed at you for asking. Like they, they don't like it. And they sell them in the bookstore. I'll demonstrate mine when I get up there. I um, have one for my laptop, um, and they're like $15, I think, something like that. Um, and I carry it with me. It is also gold, um, mm -hmm. along with the dry erase marker. That's something, yeah, I've learned to have all of those things always yep. with me. You know, the adapter, dry erase marker, the eraser, um, <laughs> extra pencils, batteries might be overkill, but sometimes yeah, 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 yeah. it doesn't hurt if you've got yeah, for, for a microphone. Um, and another really good point, pointer I can give is have IT's phone number in your phone because <laughs> when there's 300 students staring at you and the professor is nerve wracking and the thing's not working, and yeah, I call them like twice a week. I called them this morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, oh. um, you just, you know, they'll answer right away. Yep. And they'll Do you guys know where you are. You know, they'll come. Do you need to go see them? At the other end of this building, downstairs, so the, the, you, know, you were in, the, in 102, is in the middle. If you went past that, there's a door. Go right in that door, IT is right there. You can walk in and go, oh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, I know that a lot of like, projectors and document cameras and stuff have changed over the years, and then the adapters have then changed, or what, like the plugs that they have to go into your computers. Do you know if, if they're all the same? So if you have like one adapter, is it, would it work on all of them? Or do you, right, do you have one that's then obsolete for like the particular classroom that you're in, and then you get assigned another classroom? Yeah, everything has the 15 point uh, PGA on it, okay. and you, you need have the to adapter then to go into yeah. your HDMI. Okay. So that, yeah, all right. That's, yeah. it's, it's on all of them. But if you're a Mac user, you need a thing that plugs so in. Then, uh, yeah. yeah. But or I guess like certain projectors now else. are like USB enabled, and so you don't even. Right need that one because it just a USB will connect, but you need the you need the adapter that'll take back to USB. Right. Okay. And for some of the newer PC computers, like they don't have the VGA thing, so right. you're gonna have to figure out for the maker of your laptop what adapter you can get, because that was a problem for some of my Yeah, I, I use my Kindle right. on these and I just have a, an adapter and I've got one that I keep saying I'm gonna give to Dory for her whatever that thing is, the, the Google book or whatever. Uh, yeah. Chromebook. Chromebook. Yeah. Because, um, you know, just, they're just different adapters. You get them and they work fine. And you just plug them right there. So, one question. So does it have to be Mac, you can see, if you have Microsoft Windows? No, you're fine. That's actually, you don't need the adapter then. That just plugs right in. Sometimes, also, I just thought the system goes to sleep and you have to turn it back on. There's a password you need on that little guy right there. Is it 2005? It's the same in every room. It's the same in every room. I think it's 2005. And it's written somewhere on there. Yeah, because that's yeah. what makes it so secure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're writing it right on the device. Because nobody thinks to look there. Yeah. I, the reason I know that is because I had to go down to IT one time and they said, let's put it on it. And I had to come yeah. back up. Oh, okay. I was on the phone about that. Yeah. Like, it's on the thing. Oh, okay. I didn't think it would be that obvious. Like. Well, I actually went back and asked him, why the hell did you put a password on it if it's a good well? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, like some of the newer buildings, like you should definitely have IT number on your phone because it comes through. But like I know that uh, what is it? That newer SSM or SSB? I don't know. The one with the orange alien chair. SSB. Whatever. SSB. Yeah. SSB. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know that like the newer equipment has like a little button on the thing. Like if you need IT help, you just push the button. Up, like, really. they just and they up. materialize. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like, like State Farm is there. Me and Yep, Scotty, kind of. I was thinking more Star Trek. Yeah. yeah well, I'm, a little, I'm a little more with it than you guys. Uh, you guys are dating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going there. That's the room that you're teaching in. It's an library. You actually can get the uh, markers and the eraser and everything. Because I was in a room giving a workshop and it wasn't 
it, the, no instructions were written on how to start everything, and that there was no display like that. And I was like, well, I don't know what to do. And they came over and. Now, in over. the library, in the classrooms in the library, not on that end, but in the ones that are in the library library, they have smart boards. Mm -hmm. And those smart boards use special electronic pens. Do not use your eraser, erasable marker on those white, on those, because they're white, they look just like whiteboard. Touch it with your hand first. Yeah, if it's rough and it's not smooth like this, that ink won't come off. And they have to come and strip those to get, get it off. So if you accidentally grab your pen and write on that board, we're all gonna know about it. For a long time. So don't that, write your name. Yeah, don't write your name, your phone number, you know, anything derogatory about your instructor of record. Um, just be, just in that in those rooms, be careful. I, I don't know about over in well, you guys are all social sciences. So um, and the rooms that you would use, that's the only one you have to worry about. Shouldn't be that conflict that Michael mentioned briefly. Um, 
Um, and then the um, download them. Oh, if you so they're automatically emailed after grades have been submitted. So there's no that also preserves the integrity of the evaluations. And then in addition to that, if for some reason you lose the email or can't find the PDF, you can always we have a process by which you can actually request them, and we can give you past evaluations. Wait, you said that the evaluations were mailed. Are you talking about after they've already been filled out? Is that what you're talking about? The results. The so results. we will okay. send them to you instructors via email after final, about a week or so after final grades have been submitted. So the turnaround time is pretty, pretty reasonable. And, and they're very well organized. They're, they're, they're very good. I thought of what I wish I had known. <laughs> 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 I wish I had known. I don't know if this is true for all departments, but within psychology, there can be huge variation in your workload as a TA depending on who your instructor of record is. I found that working with a lecturer has much less to do because they do most of it, whereas if you're working with a you know, tenure track or full professor, they're more concerned about their research, and so you end up doing a lot of the work for the class. Um, yeah, that can really dictate how your semester goes, but like I said, that's in psychology. I don't know if that's true across the board. That, but that is, it is the average that yeah, the contract is for. If you, go, but if you go beyond that, that's why you do want to track it. Because if you go beyond that, then, then the instructor won't give you any rest, but then you got to go to the meeting. Uh, you were talking about the If you're working with a professor, um, of course you are, with uh, your own advisor, um, do not always mention that you have a lot of TA work to put uh, in priority before your research, because that really does them off. So you wouldn't know, but when you talk to them and, and just mention that, sorry, this week I can't do my research, I have a lot of TA work to do, just try not to mention that yeah. and make the balance yourself. Or unless it's really something that is bothering you or there's a huge workload in just that one week. But try not to like, talk about that too much in front of your advisor. Yeah, if I could just echo that, um, I think expecting to teach and be students, but really um, the emphasis should be on your research. I mean, there are all different schools of thought sometimes of balance and what you really want to focus on depends on your career goals, but you know, you should make sure that you're getting your research done. I mean, it's very easy to get caught up in teaching because it's fun and, and you see like tangible results in students who have, you know, grown in their, you know, knowledge of you know, history over a semester. Um, and you know, your research is typically four or five years long, so you don't see as much, you know, as quickly as you want to. So so that's something to be negotiated by all of us. And um, I think also working for your advisor as a TA is often um, an interesting balance as well. Um, you, for some people, it's perfect and fabulous. You become even closer with your advisor. And then for some people, you switch from like a mentor-mentee relationship to employee-employee, employer um, relationship, which is slightly different too. So there's lots of kind of careful, interesting changes <laughs> as you go through your um, graduate degree and, and teaching load that I, I urge you to kind of think about. Yeah. Um, so on, on the note earlier, I know we've been told several times now that we can go to the you want to engage in a certain situation. Sometimes it can be pretty threatening to, um, to um, instructors, um, but oftentimes it gets a conversation started. Um, there are ways to approach um, expectations at the beginning of the semester, so you're clear about your workload and what
what is expected of you. Um, but also, you know, sometimes it's okay to bring in an external um, force to talk about kind of uh, what's um, what's going on with your workload. But, but that's tricky. I mean, it's tricky in every job, right? Like, when do you manage up your boss, right? That's kind of difficult. And, and you also have to realize that it's, it, it is an average. So you're going to have weeks when you have 60 hours of grading. And you're going to have weeks where you have none, right? So, yeah, and those, those those weeks when you have the 60 hours, you're feeling very put upon. I mean, you, you really, it, it sucks. And so, you you have to manage their, sometimes you have to manage their expectations. And, and if you are overloaded on a regular, consistent basis, you can go and say, you know, I'm only limited to 20 hours, average 20 hours a week. Is there some way we can cut this down? And they might go, is it taking, you know, they, they may not be aware. You want to go to them first always um, and, and give them the opportunity to to, uh, to rectify the situation. And many of them will go, I didn't realize it was taking you so long. Is there a way I can help? And they'll often pitch in. Um, oftentimes when you get down to finals and you think I'm going to be swamped, and you just go, I've, I've got three days to get all these done. And the instructor will go, well, I'll take half. Right? So getting to the union rep is sometimes way down the road, but right. but you can't be taken advantage of. Your primary purpose is to do your research. Mm -hmm. So what is it like? Good defense is a... What, good offense. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, how's that going for you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Not for six to nine months. Thank <laughs> you. So just to add on that, uh, it's very true, at least, and I have only TA for computer science courses, and the staff in computer science, the faculty, they're great. Um, they really care about not putting too much uh, load on you so that you, uh, they stop you from your own research. So always when you go first to an uh, instructor, the, they will, uh, as far as I know, they're nice enough to try to make it easier. So uh, always try that unless it's really hard. And, 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 if, and if you need a completely unbiased person to speak with, the, the, center, the Center for Research on Teaching Excellence, you can always come and talk to us, um, confidential conversation about anything, almost, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, especially related to teaching, um, you know, that we can help in any way, we have individual consultations, and if you're trying to decide, is this an issue, is this not, or, you know, at one point I spoke with somebody who was having trouble with another one of the TAs. Um, and it seemed like the instructor was playing favorites and she came to me and we kind of talked about it and I helped her sort of work through it. So if there's an issue with the instructor and you're hesitant to sort of talk to them about it or an issue with another TA and you're not sure how to handle it, you can come to you know, the Center for Research on Teaching Excellence and we can try to help out or, or you know, point you in another direction if we can't do anything to help. Or, but it's completely confidential and you don't have to worry about me chatting with somebody else about it. For, for most of your instructors of record are going to be somebody's advisor. They may not be yours, but they're somebody's advisor. And you're all here because someone saw in you the ability to get an advanced degree, whether it's a master's or a PhD. Right? They're not here to get rid of you. They're not here to see you fail. They're all here to see you succeed because we make them look good. When we go out and get a job or we get published or we do whatever, it reflects back on them. They're just as concerned about our success as we are. This isn't like when you were an undergrad and it's like you passed and fail. They want you to succeed. We won't all succeed. Some of us won't make it. But they wouldn't have taken us. They wouldn't have committed their time. They wouldn't have committed the university's money to getting you here just so they can give you a bad time. Right? They're here to help you get through. And they, and many of them have been where you are. And they completely understand it. So, they're, they're your friends, right? Your job while you're here is to become their peer, right? Those but you don't start off as that. You don't start off as it, so don't, right. don't think you do. But, but when they finally put that hood on you, you're almost there. Well, you gotta get a job, but um, yeah, when they, when they loop that little thing over your head, you're, you're, you, you are becoming a peer, and that's the goal. So they're not here to beat you up. I'm sorry I have to leave, but I wanted to say all the things you have said, and thank you, Amy, for putting this together. We see you on campus, you can find me on it. Sometimes. <laughs> I thought of something.
something that is kind of awkward to talk about, but you guys may not have thought of, but um, setting really clear boundaries for undergrads, especially like a really friendly undergrads. Um, <laughs> Why would you have a problem? It has happened. It's Did they invite you to the kegger? Because that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, whoa. Yeah. I don't know. I don't really have advice. Just be aware that it might happen. Um, and if you're extremely yeah. uncomfortable, you know, you might have a fellow TA that you can refer that student to. You can talk to the instructor of record. Um, yeah. It's real. But that also goes into that that division of we're not the instructors of record. And we're not we're not their peers, and so you know I mean I'm old and I'm fat I can get away with wearing anything right, right. but like Danielle who you know looks younger than most of her students she has to dress a little more professionally because she needs to be the fact she's a professional right so I can walk in and put my feet up and go you know whatever and and they think I look like their grandfather I look like Santa Claus they're not they're not going to give me a hard time right. <laughs> And the same with, with I mean, no, 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 we're gonna ask me out. But the same with the other thing is, if you, if you set those boundaries, yeah, uh, if you set those boundaries, um, then you can, you can manage those things, but you have to set those boundaries. You cannot be their best friend. Right. And that will help a lot of that. And that's, that's not your job. No. It's not, you know. And especially if you, like, so I've been teaching for about 15 years, and when I first started out, obviously I looked younger than I do now. And if you're youngish looking and a small female, they tend to like, well, I've had students try to be my friend, like go to lunch with me and I'm like, and then there was the invite to the kegger and I'm like, since I'm the only one legally old enough to drink, I'm gonna say no, but thank you. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, I was like, yeah, and no, I won't buy the beer and drink it. <laughs> no, you know, and so like managing that, like, juggling that I want them to like me and learn from me, but I'm not trying to be their best friend. You need to draw a clear line in the sand, or, you know, in a sense, and, and kind of hold that line. Um, and if it does help, I mean, I've been teaching long enough, you know, so I could go and dress like this and I don't have a problem with it. Uh, but when I first started out, there were some students who were like, hey, how's it going? Let's go get pizza. And I'm like, yeah, no, since I'm going to be grading your paper tomorrow, um, I don't think that's a good idea. And it was a weird, like I didn't know how to handle it at first, but over time you develop skills. And so again, if anybody, if you have situations like that, again, the, the center is here to help you. So you know, depending on your age and gender, it may be more of an issue or less of an issue. But um, in talking with other female colleagues who maybe look younger than they are, I know it's, um, it's been a problem for more than just me. The, the first time I TA'd was at a, at a different school, and we had a guy that had just graduated from Santa Cruz, so that should explain lots of that. But uh, he was trying to be everybody's butt, right? He was like, hey, dude, and high-fiving him when they come into class. And then he, has to, he starts looking at his grade book, and nobody's turning anything in. And he's going to his students, he goes, where, where, where is everybody? He goes, hey, dude, we're like friends. Like, you know, just, you can skip it. The next semester, he came in in a tie, and he was Mr. Sanders, because he had to establish the fact that he wasn't their butt. And so you, you have to find, and it'll take a semester or two sometimes to find that balance. And that's yeah. sometimes why I insist on Dr. Fenstermaker or, you know, yeah. because I, I know I do look young, and so if they have to call me that every time they speak to me, otherwise they'll just say, um, Amy. and speak at you. Well, they won't even use a name. They'll okay. just say, um, and start talking. That's right, you're female. And so, and then, yeah. <laughs> so initially, I, you know, when I, once I finished that PhD, I was like, no, we're going to go with Dr. Fenstermaker, and that's what I'm putting. And don't put your first name on the syllabus. Because then they see it and they think, oh, I can start calling you that. And you're like, no. You need a reminder that what my role in this room is. And so if that's Ms. or, you know, Mr. or whatever, um, you know, lay down, set the expectations of what you want to be called on day one as well. Um, that way they can't just, hey, Amy, what's up? Also find out from your professors what they want to be called. Yes. Because some prefer to be called by their first names. You will probably refer to them by their first names. Uh, as their grad students, especially. Um, but undergrads but, don't but the undergrads may not be allowed to call them by their first names. And yeah. so you need to refer to them then as Dr. So and so, Professor So and so, um, if that's their preference. And the undergrads here don't know. So like we have a lot of first generation students that don't understand how to how it works the with, with it, professors. Yeah. So then they'll get professors that are super cool and like really chill and they're like, oh you can call me with you know like first name or whatever. And then they get to another professor and they're just appalled yeah. 
right, that they would dare to like, you know, and so you have to help them with that. Like that's like an area where you can come in and say, like, like what, they ask me like, why did you get to call him like what his first name or whatever? Because I've earned it. Right? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> See the stack of degrees? I got here that way. Yeah. And so, you know, like they'll ask you about those things and it also depends on the assertion. Like you'll know, like you'll get a sentence just by like how they respond to your emails, like, oh, yeah. like, or how they say, like, you should tell them this. Like, they'll, they'll explain things to you also, and like, you can like pass on them. You're like, they're, you're almost like a liaison between the two, right? Like, you're passing communicate, like, information from one to the other. Um, but I think the best advice that I got for like TAing was from the chair of our department, and she was like, because most of us were females, um, there's the whole respect issue. Like they're more, undergrads are more likely to push back on you because you're a woman, right? And a lot of them are big. They're just giant humans. And right, they're towering <laughs> over you, right? They're like, you know, they'll come up to you and like, they can be intimidating, uh, right? And so her suggestion was like, just be a bitch. Like, and she's like, <laughs> she's like when you first start off, like you just, like be like strict and then as time goes on as they get used to it then you can lay off and like you can you can ease up right you can always just pull you back go, you can't go the other you can't way go the other yeah way. you can't go the other way and then just to finish that up men can be bitches too so <laughs> it was, that was directed at all of us <laughs> uh so since uh since i think you mentioned uh that some of them are first first generation college students awesome. and they don't really know uh, how much of, especially with lower division classes, how much of the teaching assistant's role is teaching like study habits and introducing them to college as opposed to? That's done in core and in uh, writing 10 and writing 1. And, and the, the, that's not your job. Your job is to teach content. But you can help them with their writing. It's, but it depends on the course you do and like what you're doing. Um, for me, like I'm in sociology, it's part of what I do, and so like for me, it was easy. Like I did research. I was a first generation student, so there was a lot of things that I could just like drop it in in the middle of like whatever I was talking about, right? And just like incorporate into whatever we were discussing. And then like if they come to office hours and they have questions, right? Like that's an area where you can sort. But it isn't your job, right? Like so, you can do like as you see fit. But like six, I think it's something like sixty-one percent of our students, our undergrads, are first-generation college students, which um, is defined as neither one of their parents graduated from a four-year university. So that is not the environment I came from. So I had parents who were like, "Well, no, you get in there and you ask," or you know, so they might not know sort of you know what to do when they need help. Um, they certainly don't know how very often to email their professor. They just kind of launch into the email, and we cover that. I come from the writing program. Um, we cover a lot of that, but it doesn't mean it sticks in one semester. Um, and so, yes, your job is to teach your disciplinary content, but especially if it's a first-year freshman course, they're all wide-eyed and freaking out, and you know, help them along a little. I had someone directly ask me in office hours once, "How should I study?" No, I wasn't going to say, like, that's not my job, go away. Like, yeah, I, I helped, you know, so it's, there's a lot of gray area in, you know, what, I don't know, we're required to do, I guess, as TAs versus what you kind of want to do as a human <laughs> to help this other human. Um, and you just have to, you know, decide for yourself. You're going to have to help them, like, get ready for their exam, right? Like, you're going to, depending on your how you're doing your TA assignment. But, like, for me, for my discussions, like, I had to spend, like, one day, like before the exam, like just helping them go over the study guide or just preparing and then just giving them advice. Like, well, I would suggest you approach this this way or like think about it like this. And I would drop in like advice on how to study and how to prepare. So. Speak, speaking of study for your exams, if, if you have, right before your exam, if you have something already scheduled for section, as long as your instructor of record is comfortable with it, you can reserve a room and you can have your students come in and you can do a, a, a review session as long as it's made available to all the students in the class, not just your section. You can't give your students an advantage that the other sections don't have. So you would go to your instructor records and say, look, I'm going to do a study session. If, if, 
if it's okay, I'm going to do a study session, I'm going to get a room over in the library, can we announce it for everybody, and then I'll just, it doesn't matter whose section they're in or whatever, and you might get a you know, third or half of the students show up to do So you can do, you can, there are ways you can go above and beyond. Um, again, keeping in mind that your primary reason is to do research. Well, then, with that being said, have you ever experienced a class where they just all good care of them? Yeah. <laughs> Where it seems like the majority of them are, you know, failing. Yeah. yeah. So, do you end up like, I would find myself taking that as a personal mistake. Like, I'm not doing my job right, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it might be the way that. Uh, Our students, I was telling the people in, 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 in IH and in World Cultures, our students qualify to go to Berkeley. Our students qualify to go to UCLA. Our students are UC qualified undergraduate students. However, the majority of our students don't have the background. They didn't come from the greatest high schools. They have the test scores, they have the GPA, they have the smarts. They don't have the experience and they don't have the foundation. And so the first year, they struggle. I mean, I, I, I had a young lady walk up to me last, yeah, last, last year, and I didn't recognize her because she'd grown up so much. And Right? I had her very, her very first semester. Poor girl was failing. She now was was you know a good C, you know good, good uh, uh, B plus GPA, but she almost failed out the first year because she just didn't have the skills. And she came to office hours and I helped her with some stuff. She came up was thank, showering me with all these thanks for helping. I barely remembered having done it because it was four years before, but it mattered to her. Um, these students went. You know, I was an undergrad at UCLA. I know what a UC student should look like. And, and their second years, they are UC students. Our first year, and many of our students are going to be brand new freshmen and brand new transfer in. They don't have the skills. And, you know, it's up to you. It's up to them how much they come and ask for help. And then it's up to you how much you're able to help them. And if you can't help them, then send them to the tutor center. You know, we have tutors on campus. We have the writing center. We have all kinds of, of resources to help those students. And Nothing, and I mean, I've had students come in and say, I got raped last weekend, and I've had to take her down to counseling, right? I mean, sometimes you're the one they'll come to because you're the one they trust. So, you know, it, it's what you can, it's what, what, you, what you feel you can do, and how you can get that other resources sometimes. I guess that was a good idea, but yeah, it's what happens. I've never had a student say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hadn't until this last semester, and I was like, <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, you can walk with the caps. That's where we went. On campus, yeah. Um.